Good morning. Our text this morning is in 1 John chapter 4. We'll begin in verse 7. First John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses Jesus, uh, confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God is, uh, has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this is love perfected with us so that we might have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he, has, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let us pray together. Our righteous Father, we thank you for the great gift of your love. We thank you that you taught us through the patriarchs, through Moses, through the prophets, that you prepared mankind for the coming of your Son, and that you sent your Son to live among us, to live as a man, to be tempted in every way as we are tempted, yet without sin. We thank you for his ministry. We thank you, Father, for his sacrifice for his death on the cross, his blood that cleanses us of our sins. We thank you for the hope that we have in his resurrection. And Father, we eagerly await the day of his coming. And Father, in all of these things, we see your love for us, and we pray for a greater and greater capacity to love each other and to love you as you have loved us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So John, over the course of his epistle, has been presenting us the consequences of the gospel. All right, in the first part of the epistle, we saw what it means to live in the light as God is light. All right, he says, that's what we've received from the beginning. We know that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so he lays out the consequences of that. And in this last half of the letter, he has been laying out what it means to be children of God. Our text this morning contains one of the most famous statements of the Bible. God is love. This is a theological statement. It tells us something about the nature of God. And just as we've seen throughout the letter, John always ties his theology 
to his ethics. That is the way that we act. Right? Again, we saw it in the first half. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. That, that's theology. That tells us about God. But it has consequences for us. The way that we live, the way that we act. Anyone who walks in the darkness and says that he knows God is a liar, John says. The truth is not in him. All right, there are consequences for us based on who God is. We must walk in the light because God is light. Likewise, this truth, God is love, is a theological statement. It tells us about God, and it also has implications for how we live. And this much is evident from the very beginning of our text this morning. All right, go back to the beginning, chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. All right, he hits us with a theological statement at the end, God is love, but he hits us with it as, as what explains everything that he's been saying. We have to love one another. Right? Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Right? The reason for that, the reason why that's true about our actions, our behavior, is because of what's true about God, that God is love. But we have to start with good theology before we can understand good ethics. What does John mean when he says God is love? It was, as we said, this is one of the most famous statements in the Bible. All right, this is something that even worldly people are familiar with. Right? This, is, this is the kind of thing that you will see. It, it fits really well on a bumper sticker. Right? So you will see this statement collecting exhaust on cars all over the United States. And where the world gets a hold of Scripture, brothers, we have to tread carefully. Because John has already told us more than once that the world is opposed to the Father. And of course, we know also that the devil knows how to quote Scripture. So when we hear the world parroting the words of Scripture, parroting the words of John, we have to take care to discern whenever we are interpreting the word. Right? Does the world understand these words in the way that John means them? All right. How are we to understand these words? Are we going to go along with the world on them? Or are we going to follow the word on them? John explains the love of God in our text this morning. All right? right after he tells us that God is love, in verse 9 he says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us. Right? In other words, this theology took on flesh, it became real, it became apparent. The love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. In these two short verses, we learn much about the love of God. It is sacrificial. It seeks to reconcile where once there was separation. It deals with sin. In other words, it, it confronts it and handles it. Now, if you've been following along in our auditorium class, we've been studying the Law of Moses, we've been studying the sacrifices, a lot of that material pays off here, right? Because our understanding of the sacrifices plays into this. Right? All of these concepts bound up in the biblical concept of a sacrifice, they're here. Right? Sacrifice is giving of oneself, but as we've seen in our study, it's, it's more than just giving of oneself, it, it's for a purpose. Right? The, it makes amends for wrongdoing, right? but again, it's, it's also more than that. The ultimate aim of the sacrifice, whatever sacrifice we're looking at in Moses... And also the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right here. The ultimate aim is fellowship, drawing near to God. And John tells us that's what God's love looks like. When John says, God is love, this is how we're to understand it. Is that God wants his creatures to draw near to him. 
And so to do that, he gave his son as a sacrifice to deal with our sin so that we could draw near to him. All right, it's all there in those two verses. God's love was made manifest to, uh, among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, to atone for us, to, to satisfy God's wrath. And if that's what God's love looks like, John says, then that's what all love looks like. Anything that's fit to bear the name of love looks like that. Because John has told us, love is from God. And so anything that we can truly call love looks like this. It looks like fellowship. It looks like giving of oneself. It looks like making amends for wrongdoing. It looks like dealing with sin. This is not the world's concept of love. Right? Worldly love is good feelings when it regards superficial things. And when it regards important things, it's apathy. Right? It's, we feel good about things so long as things aren't really important. But when things do get really important, well, we just kind of pretend like they don't exist. Right? The, the worldly word for it is tolerance, which again, like love, they also use falsely. Right? It is the, the kind of go along, get along, sweep it under the rug sort of thing. Be nice. Don't confront people with anything. You know, not that we're to be aggressive and confrontational in that sense, but worldly love just completely ignores sin, pretends that it doesn't exist. The love of God is not apathetic about our lifestyle. The love of God does not say, well, don't be mean to me, just let me do what I want. That's not the love of God. That's not love. In that sense, the love of God is demanding. The love of God is not superficial. Far from it, the love of God is the gravest thing imaginable. The love of God is bloody, the Son of God had to die because of it. And John says, Beloved, let us love one another. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And he says, If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now that's a high calling. And John's going to have a little bit more to say about it later on in our text. But notice that it's, it's right out here at the beginning. That the aim of this, in terms of our behavior, is that we love one another. That in our dealings with each other, we mirror God's dealings with us. It's a high calling... And it's one of the most important things that we have. In fact, it is essentially the whole kit and caboodle, as it were. Because John spends the next several verses tying together all kinds of themes and motifs that we've seen throughout the letter. Right? We've seen him pull in a bunch of different ideas, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different images for expressing those ideas, and we see almost all of them crop up again over the next few verses in our text this morning. Right, go to verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. All right, and John's been talking about that for the whole letter. God abiding in us, us abiding in him. Because he has given us of his spirit. All right, we read about that last week. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. All right, in fact, a lot of this mirrors what we read in our text last week. Right, if you go back to chapter 3, verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this 
We know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. For whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Right? That John is repeating here in our text this morning this assurance of the spirit. He repeats the importance of confessing the nature of Jesus Christ in its fullness, that Jesus is the Son of God, that God sent Jesus to be the Savior of the world. Right? John has taught us all of these things, and we confess them. And now John draws a conclusion from them, all right, that it's all tied to God's love. Verse 16, chapter 4, verse 16. So, we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. That is, all of these things that we believe and confess, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, whom God sent to be a propitiation for our sins, right? that, uh, that we have received the Spirit, and that God abides in us and that we abide in Him. If we believe all of these things, what John is telling us is that what we, what we believe is God's love. Again, God's love encompasses all of this, the whole gospel message that John has been writing about in this letter. And again, this is the whole ball of wax. John tells us that if we abide in God through his love, then, as we read in verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we might have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he, is so, as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. In the ultimate sense, in the end... This godly love that we have been reading about in 1 John is everything. The love of God is our consolation and our confidence. Be because of the love of God, we can be confident in the judgment, John says. Not shrinking back in fear at the Lord's coming. If we have been living in God's love. Now again, John has, and John has been telling us this throughout the letter, that love is not some passive thing, that love is an active thing. All right, this, this is an if. All right, by this is love perfected in us so that we might have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we are in this world. That is, if we are mirroring the love of God in our own lives, in our own dealings, in our own love, then there's no fear. Right? Fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now John finishes our text this morning by bringing us kind of back around to the beginning. And you've probably noticed as we've gone through 1 John, John, John likes to walk in spirals. Right? He's, he's heading a certain direction, but he's going to loop back and go forward and loop back and go forward and loop back and go forward. And he brings us back around at the end of our reading this morning to what we started out with. Verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Right? In other words, this, this truth that we learned in the beginning, that God is love and that his love has been made manifest among us through his son being sent for a propitiation for our sins, he says that is something that we participate in. Right? That's something that we live out. And if we don't live it out, and we say that we have the love of God in us, we're liars. Right? Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And who is my brother, one might ask. John answers that. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And again, John's tying a lot of things together here. He's tying the confession of faith together with obedience. And he says that's how we know that we're children of God. Right? That's how we know that we're living in the love of God. Right? And, this, and this all fits. Again, remember what the love of God does. It confronts sin. It reconciles us to God by dealing with that sin. And so, of course, John is able to say that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Right? That's, that's what his love has come to accomplish. We haven't been keeping his commandments. We've been in sin, and that sin separates us from him. And so God's love is manifested among us by him sending his son to be a propitiation for our sins. How could the love of God, how could our love for God not include obeying his commandments? It is as Jesus himself said. Go, to, go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. John 15. We'll start in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you... Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full." This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Right? Notice the way that Jesus is presenting his love. It's... You know, surprise, surprise that, that the Apostle John would express the love of God in exactly the same ways that Jesus did. Right? And Jesus stresses the, the essential nature of obedience. Right? It's something that we're all bound to. Even Jesus himself says, 
right? As I keep my Father's commandments and abide in his love, so you keep my commandments and abide in my love. And John says, look, that's, that's all of a piece. It is all of a piece. And it tells us about how we are to treat one another. That we learn to love those who are children of God. As God has loved us. And who are the children of God? Who are my brothers, in other words? Those who believe that Jesus Christ, uh, that Jesus is the Christ, and those who keep God's commandments. And the result is fellowship, is reconciliation, is holiness. And so we call everyone here this morning to live this life. To love one another. For God is love. To keep God's commandments because God is love. If there are any here this morning who have not become disciples of Jesus Christ, who have not confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, we invite you this morning to become part of our brotherhood. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus as Lord. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Joined in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection so that you can walk as a new creature and so that you can live this life in accordance with the love of God. For God is love. We invite all who are in need, come forward as together we stand and sing.